Shabbat Shalom to everyone. Shabbat shalom. It's nice seeing everyone. We had uh, some young people here early on, and there wasn't confusion. We were able to have an early service and a later service, and everyone knew where they were supposed to go. Even though there was a little bit of crisis, especially in the front row last week, we got over it. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Friends, names matter. And when Jane and I became parents, and I, I know you guys, you spent like decades <laughs> contemplating Everly's name. I have no idea how you got to that beautiful name, but we're not going to ask you. But I'm going to tell you about my, our name. Okay, so when Jane and I were, became parents, we struggled with our children's names, and there were certain criteria about what the name had to be. It needed to be a Hebrew name. I wanted our children to have one identity, Hebrew and the same name. They're Leora and Noam, they're both Hebrew names. It needed to be able to be pronounced. There wasn't gonna be Chaim. It, there wasn't gonna be God knows. It had to be, of course, connected to a um, deceased relative. It had to have a special meaning. Noam means a delight. Leora means a light unto, um, a light unto the nations. And, and this was critical, when we were yelling at them, the name had a fit. So I, I, I'm not exaggerating this. So we'd say, we'd practice. Noam, come here. It sounds good. Leora, could you go to your room? So that's, that's how the names got into being, and they, they've worked. They, that's absolutely true. I'm not exaggerating. Now, our biblical reading for this Shabbat provides a way for us to examine the issue of names. God speaks to Moses and reintroduces God's self to Moses, and it is a rather mysterious statement that he makes. Um, God says, God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but I did not make myself known to them by the name yud heh vav -Hey, the name, you know, when someone says Hashem, that's what, or Adonai, it's in place of yud heh vav -Hey. We don't say the name, okay? We don't really know how to say the name. An approximation would be Yahweh if you heard that name, but it's not how it was pronounced, but yud heh vav -Hey. Now, El Shaddai, now, what's the difference between calling God El Shaddai, God Almighty, and this new personal name, yud heh vav -Hey, which no one is sure how to pronounce? And what does it mean that this name was not known before? It's just not clear what's being said in the Torah. The name issue becomes more complicated in the Torah. God has many names. For example, last week Moses asked, what shall I call you when the people ask me, what is your name? And we hear this mysterious response, ayeh, asher, ayeh, tell them, the best translation is, I will be what I will be. A mysterious name for an elusive God. But this isn't the end of the story. There are many additional names for God, and I decided to give you a partial list. And I'm not going to stop until I'm at the end of the list. I got three pages of them. <laughs> so hold on. Buckle your seatbelts. El, which means strength, might, power. El Emet, the God of truth. El Tzadik, the righteous God. El Shaddai, the all-sufficient God. El Elyon, the most high supreme God. Adon Alam, master of the world. El Roi, God who sees me. El Gibor, the mighty God. El Deot, the God of knowledge. El Hagadol, the great God. El Hakavod, the God of glory. El Hanun, the gracious God. El Rahum, the God of compassion. El Kana, the jealous God. I'm not done yet. Adonai, my master. Oseh Shalom, maker of peace. Shekhinah, the female presence of God. Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king. Ein Sof, endless, infinite. Ha Kadosh, the holy one. Makom, the place. Tzur Yisrael, rock of Israel. 
Yotzer Or, the fashioner of light, um, El Melech Ne'eman, God, faithful king, and I haven't even added the mystical names that are from the mystical tradition. Now, I can imagine that what I'm saying is a little confusing. Why can't we Jews decide on the name and get on with it? Like everything else, the devil is in the details. Judaism is so theologically sophisticated. I want you to, it's so beautiful. I mean, when you think about it, no one name can capture the totality of God's reality. That's what this is all about. What we, what we all too often fail to recognize is that when it comes to the quest for God, one size doesn't fit all. Rabbi Edward Klein, who was the uh, a rabbi from the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York, is quoted as saying, each from his own vo viewpoint glimpses ultimate reality. And each viewpoint viewpoints to a truth if the person's quest is sincere and faith is strong. Once we think that we have the final version, we have the story of the tradition. No human can fully grasp the reality of God. God's reality keeps on unfolding. Our views keep on changing. God cannot be grasped or defined by one name. And the great psychoanalyst, Eric Fromm, who happened to be a very learned Jew, stated that, in fact, God is beyond all names, all designations and definitions. No human being can depict in words or any other forms of expression the complete essence of God. This modern Jewish understanding is important for our own religious journeys. We are never allowed to be smug about our faith. No one can ever say or believe that they have the ultimate religious understanding. That idea should offend us. Literally, it should offend us. To believe in God is by definition to recognize that no one possesses the whole not the whole name, not the whole truth, not the authentic tradition. By definition, religion requires humility and tolerance. Now, I find Judaism's approach to God, it, it just makes sense to me. I embrace its radical monotheism. There is one God and that God wants something for me. I love its openness to different ideas of God. I am challenged by the reality that we are told that we are to do these mitzvot, these, these, these actions that bring us closer to God or make us godly. I'm energized by the idea that study will bring, using my intellect will bring me closer to God. I am proud that Judaism affirms the ethical foundation of our religion. And I am assured, reassured that Judaism embraces the idea of repentance, that is, we do something wrong, we can change and become better. I cannot say that Judaism is the best religion, however. It is the most compelling for me, and is my heritage, but other religions are to be honored too. They make sense to others. There are no Academy Award for the best religion. It does not work that way. The question, who is right, has no useful purpose in religion. And that question is a source, as we know, of much evil and violence in the world. What do I have, why do I have to convince another person that my religious views are righteous and theirs are not? That conversation should never happen. It's wrong, it's evil, it should be forbidden. Now let me share with you, and I, by accident, I stumbled on this thing, and it was written January 14th. I don't know how I stumbled on it, but I stumbled on it. There was a newspaper article written by a Pentecostal minister named Paul Brather on January 14th, 2023 at 2.47 a.m. Okay? That's when it was posted to some paper. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, but again, I don't know how I got it, but it's good. And what he was doing, he reflected upon what his life was like being a religious writer. Okay, even though he's currently a Pentecostal minister. And what he said was so beautiful and uplifting. I wanted to share it with you. Uh, look ba looking back, I find I've learned something about God 
and his purposes from nearly every faith tradition I've encountered. From Baptists, I've learned a respect for and devotion to the Bible. From Pentecostals, I've learned that God blesses us with emotions and that it's liberating to worship using those emotions in our full bodies. God gave us brains, of course, but he has also blessed, blessed us with ecstasy, fears, and dance, tears, and dancing. Hallelujah. From mainline Protestants, I learned that those aforementioned brains perform better when trained in critical thinking. From black Protestants, I've learned the spiritual worth of social action, of the church as an instrument for improving society. From Catholics, I learned the power of history, tradition, and contemplation, as well as the new aspects of the Eucharist. From Muslims, I've learned the power of daily prayers and rituals. From Buddhists, I've learned that suffering is inevitable, but there's inner peace to be gained when we surrender to the truth that suffering reveals. And then he talks about the Jews. Are you curious? What do you think? Should I tell them what he says about the Jews? Yes. Okay. It's really beautiful. He says, from Jews, I've learned a lot. <laughs> well, That's it? That goes with it. No, no. Okay, I'm sitting down. No. Yet this thing stands out. I once sat in on a class taught by a Jewish scholar. I've told this story before. I have no contemporaneous notes from the lecture, so bear with my faulty memory. The scholar talked about one Jewish mode of studying of scriptures. It says the Torah is so alive and multi-layered that when people read it, they'll get different meanings from it. 10 of us, say, might read a passage in Exodus, and we'd arrive at 10 different interpretations. And all the 10 of us, in our limited way, would be right. In other words, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not that if my interpretation is correct, yours is automatically wrong, or vice versa. More likely, we're both right. We've each gotten our individual insights into the Holy Word, and we've each received the nugget allotted to us. What we should do then is compare our 10 interpretations freely. To the extent we share our glimpses, we might discover a far bigger truth emerging. This idea speaks to me. I've come to apply it not just to the study of scripture, but to spirituality generally. God is so great, none of us can comprehend all that he is. 10 of us, or the 10 denominations even, can't grasp the full mystery. Now, it is interesting, he took the most from Jews, of course. But that's because I think something is compelling to him. Thus, we ought to approach other pilgrims with open minds and open our hearts looking for what we can impart to them and also what we can receive from them. Some religious people find this suggesting alarming. They have trouble imagining that folks from other faiths might know of anything. Or they misunderstand me to say that all religions are alike, or that they're all equally valid. That's not what I'm saying. Faith traditions vary widely, and a few religious groups are stone cold wacko. For the record, I'm content, I'm content as a Pentecostal preacher and intend to continue right along with it. Still, there's much to be learned from those who see God differently from us. And much of what we learn is helpful. Sometimes it's life-changing. Listen and sharing are worth the efforts and the risk. May we keep that in mind during this new year. It's not a is, I, and, and what's shocking is to me is, you don't see a, Pente, a Pentecostal. I mean, you, you know Pentecostal. That doesn't, it doesn't sound Pentecostal. But he, it's very interesting how he holds on to his faith, and yet. He, through his writing, and in, he's seen the beauty in, the, in all things and the recognition. No one's got the truth. All of us has a bit of it. So my final thoughts is, for tonight are, God is too great for any one name. I love my religion. It's not, it is not the right religion. It's my religion. Religion can be destructive without humility. I, don't, I do not grasp everything. And finally, 
Let our quest for a glimpse of God's reality in the world lead us to be loving, caring, soulful, and thoughtful people. This world needs those kinds of people so greatly. Shabbat shalom.